This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 258. This week, we welcome Professor Mayer Statman, and this is an incredible interview. Mayer uh, talked about how finance is all about maximizing well-being. He's well-known in our field, and we're so grateful to get a chance to speak with him. Uh, Mayer is the Glenn Klemick Professor of Finance at Santa Clara University, where his research focuses on behavioral finance. His most recent book, Behavioral Finance, the Second Generation, was published by the CFA Institute Research Foundation. Ben, what are your thoughts after this unreal conversation? Well, I mean, listen, Mayor is one of the founders of behavioral finance. So speaking with him ju- just because of that was was incredible. Uh, but I think that his his thinking on finance and the, the purpose that money serves, all of that is just incredible. One of the things that I found really impactful from the conversation was the was diff- how he differentiates between errors and wants. That was to me incredible because we, you know, we're, it's the, this is the rational reminder podcast. Well, Hey, rationally, what you're doing is an error. But Mayor's point is that if someone's making an error and you tell them that it's an error, listen, normatively, yeah. you shouldn't be doing that thing. If the person says, no, no, this makes me feel good. <laughs> that can be okay. And then who's to say that it's a, that it's a bad decision that they're making. So I thought that was uh, that was incredible. Um, but Mayor's research has looked at things like um, w- what are investors' wants and, and, and needs and how do we balance those things, uh, a ton on cognitive and behavioral errors. Um, but again, then there's that balancing act of what's an error and, and what's, a, what's a want. Um, and then we talked a lot about the role of financial advice and uh, as, as a source of education to help people figure out what's an error and what's a want. I thought that was also really interesting. Um, anyway, Mayor is in the field of finance and, well, behavioral finance specifically. He's a, he's an absolute uh, an absolute giant, and he's got papers published all over the place. Um, tons of fantastic papers, and it, going through his research to prepare for this conversation that that alone was fascinating. But then, as as usual, speaking to him about the research was even even better. So I, I don't know. I, I just think this was a wonderful wonderful conversation. So his research has been published in the Journal of Finance, the Journal of Financial Economics, Review of Financial Studies, the Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis, and the Financial Analyst Journal, and many more. He's a member of the advisory board of a number of journals, including the Journal of Portfolio Management and the Journal of Wealth Management. Again, many more on top of that. Was named one of the 25 most influential people by investment advisor. He has a PhD from Columbia University and a BA and MBA from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He mentions his good friend and professional colleague, Hirsch Shepherd. He was our guest past in one in episode 167, so you might want to go check that out. I also want to give a shout out to Alex for making the kind introduction to, to Mayor to invite him to join us on the podcast. And lastly, if you listen to the audio, you might want to check out the YouTube. His artwork behind him is very cool. I thought his setup in his office was very cool. And that's yeah, his, he, he, his artwork, he said. It's not, it's his own art on the back walls. So it's a really nice setup that he has. He was uh, really fun, great stories, great guy. It was a really, really fun time. It was, it was a fun time, but you know, it's, 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 a, it's a conversation. And I remember when we talked to, to her, Sheffron, it had a similar impact on me. It just makes you realize how ridiculous it can be to try and think about everything through a rational lens. And Mayor talks about what do investors what do investors really want? Well, they don't want a mean variance optimal portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't necessarily want that. Yeah. So thinking about what investors actually want and and what fi- what role finance plays in achieving that, I think that's that's a wonderful way to look at things, and it it changes your perspective uh, a lot relative to the kind of rational normative school of thought. So I anyway. Going on and on here, but they, this was a, another very impactful conversation for me, uh, for me personally. All right, great setup. With that, let's go to our conversation with Professor Mayor Statman. <music> Professor Mayor Statman, it is a real pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to the Rational Reminder Podcast. 
I'm delighted to be with you. Excellent. Well, let's kick it off with a foundational question. What is behavioral finance? Well, behavioral finance is about financial decisions people make and the reflection of those decisions in financial markets. Hmm. Is behavioral finance compatible with markets being efficient? Well, yes, but I must uh, explain what uh, efficient markets mean because that term has become confused. Uh, there are two notions of market efficiency. Uh, one that says that prices are always equal to value. In fact, that was the definition that Fama used uh, in 1965 when he wrote uh, a paper in the Financial Analyst Journal. Somehow along the way, uh, market efficiency became a statement that say mutual fund managers are able are unable to beat the market or, or more generally that it is hard to beat the market now prices deviate from value we know that there are bubbles for example that imply prices much higher than value uh, but that does not mean that it is easy to identify those bubbles ahead of time uh, are we in a bubble now, a positive bubble, a negative bubble? I don't know. Uh, this is why I behave as if the market is efficient uh, and invest in, in index funds and I don't try to time the market. What was the response from traditional financial economists um, when you started submitting behavioral work back in the 1980s? <laughs> uh, it it uh, some of it was kind of funny. Uh, I uh, in 1984, uh, I had an interview with uh, people of another university just to check for my market value, just in case I don't get tenure at uh, Santa Clara. Uh, and I explained what uh, I'm doing, and one of them uh, said. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to tweak the profession? <laughs> and so later on, I uh, I met uh, one of them who I knew from before, uh, and I was not surprised that I never got an offer for a job from them. That's uh, that's incredible. How, how well adopted do you think behavioral finance is in financial economics today? Oh, it is. It is really, it is really mainstream now. You you will see it at the very uh, top universities. We, that is her chef uh, my friend and co-author, uh, and I were incredibly lucky that our first paper on dividends uh, was uh, accepted and published in the Journal of Financial Economics, and that was because. The referee turned out to be Fisher Black, and uh, Fisher wow. Black is a man uh, who is not only renowned for his uh, wonderful contributions uh, to our field, but also one with a very open mind and innovative one. Uh, in his uh, review was brief but <laughs> but so positive that, uh, that the editor wrote that after a lot of soul searching <laughs> i guess i agree <laughs> so so that was uh, that was funny and of course uh, delightful I don't remember where I read it, but in some of your writing, I think you mentioned that some of the editors of the journal said that they wouldn't publish again if if, the, if that paper was accepted. Is that did that happen? Well, that that is that is the story I heard uh, about that uh, paper in the journal of financial economics. Uh, later on, I met uh, one of the associate editors uh, who said that there was sort of a raucous uh, phone. Uh, meeting by the associate editors and and uh, some were so upset 
uh, by the decision to publish that paper that they said uh, that they would not uh, submit other papers to the journal. Uh, yeah, it, it never happened. I think, I think that they calmed down. Uh, but, um, but you know, it, it tells you that, uh, like uh, everywhere in life, uh, you need luck <laughs> in addition to ability. Wow. How is the second generation of behavioral finance different from the first generation? Well, you know, so at the at the early eighties, uh, we were really uh, focused on the kinds of mistakes people make, uh, those cognitive and emotional errors. And so, uh, in general, though that is not entirely true, even then, uh, in general, uh, the assumption was still that people want what rational people want, which is just maximize my wealth. Uh, and then people do things that uh, hurt their wealth, for example, uh, not realizing losses or, or trading too much. Uh, in the second generation of behavioral finance, uh, I say that People have wants that are different from high expected returns and low risk. And one direct example of that is socially responsible investing or what is known now as ESG, uh, where people, some people at least, are willing to sacrifice wealth, are willing to accept low returns to stay true uh, to their values. And so my, my first paper about socially responsible investing was published in the Financial Analyst Journal exactly 30 years ago in 1993. And, and uh, it was, for me, a way to convey to people, uh, here is something uh, that is neither risk nor return. Uh, it has to do with people's value. And some people are willing to accept higher risk and lower returns uh, to stay true to their values. Hmm. So now, now you can kind of expand it to all the things that people want. For example, high status. Um, you know, you, you, you look at that and, and of course, we all know all of us care about our status. We measure it in different ways. Uh, I know that hedge fund managers are much wealthier than I am, but but they are not in my comparison group. My comparison group is fellow professors of finance uh, and, and so on. Hmm. What's the third generation of behavioral finance? Well, I, th I think so. So the, the second generation kind of expands the domain or expands the range of behavioral finance uh, beyond uh, making mistakes and, and it, it no longer assumes that all people want is to maximize wealth. So people want to maximize wealth, but they also want to stay true to their values. The third generation of behavioral finance really broadens the lens of finance even broader. And it says, eventually, what finance is all about is maximizing people's well-being, which is a, sometimes called happiness, although happiness is, is too narrow. Uh, and and uh, so the question is, what is money for? Uh, money is for well-being. And well-being has many domains. It is family. Uh, it is friends. Uh, it is work. It is health. Uh, it is religion and, and values, it's the society. And so uh, I wrote a book uh, that uh, is called Finding Wellbeing that looks at uh, these domains. And the important thing is that uh, finances, money, uh, enhances well-being. But more than that, money underlies well-being in all the other domains. You cannot support a family without money. You cannot see a doctor without money. Uh, you cannot enroll at the university without money. 
and and so on. And so uh, some people who write about those issues of well-being and and um, happiness say things like, "What is really important is friendship." Well, <laughs> that is nice, but but friendship is not enough, and you need money even for friendship because if you're going to go on the subway to visit the friend, uh, you have to pay. <laughs> That's a great explanation. We, we've already touched on pieces of the answer to the next question, but I think there's more to it. So I still want to ask the question explicitly. What's the difference between a normal investor and a rational one? So uh, Miller, Miller and Modigliani, two well-known founders of Standard Finance, uh, defined rational investors as people, as investors, who are interested only in maximizing their wealth. So that is one pillar. And the second one is that they are indifferent to the form of that wealth. Uh, this really is a definition that they used in their exposition of dividends and the argument as to why dividends do not matter. Because they said, if you don't get a cash dividend from a company, you can create what we know now is homemade dividends by selling shares. Uh, so they are just different in form, but not in substance. Uh, and so essentially they said framing of form doesn't matter. What matter is just the, the substance. Uh, but normal people care about form as well as substance they are sometimes confused by the form uh, and sometimes they are not necessarily confused by form, but they care about form. So uh, you will have a situation, for example, where people do their accounting generally with nominal dollars. So if I got a 5%, a, a I consider it kind of a 5% raise, say one from 100,000 to 105. Now, even if inflation is just 2%, I uh, still sort of ignore it uh, and don't say, well, really, uh, in real terms, my increase in pay is only uh, 3%. But what happens is that when inflation spurts, as we have had, uh, and it gets to be, say, 9%, uh, then people say, wait a minute, I just got a 5% raise but inflation is 9%, so I'm behind. And so th this, this, for example, is why the Fed uh, is aiming at a 2% inflation rather than at zero inflation, because it is a way to let people kind of feel good <laughs> about the raises they get, uh, while yeah. in fact, they, they, are, they are penalized in terms of, of real money that they are earning. Hmm. Okay, so we, we talked about well-being uh, a, a little bit earlier, but you've you got a paper that, that really goes through this in detail. What is it that normal investors really want? So normal investors want things like, like supporting a family, like raising children, um, like finding satisfying work. Uh, and 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 well pay, paying uh, work. Uh, they they want health. They want to be true to their values, as I said. And so, what what uh, I am implying, or what I think of as the third generation of behavioral finance, is really to see people as whole person, uh, and and really have not just financial well being. Do I have enough money for retirement, for example, but really life well-being? That is at the center of the, the third generation of behavioral finance. And, and if I if I kind of come back and tie it back to the notion of rational versus normal, uh, rational people just want wealth, you know, call it financial well-being. Uh, and and there are avoiding all of those errors that can get in the way. Uh, normal people 
wants extend beyond just money. Uh, and, and so uh, they do make mistakes, uh, but, but you have to distinguish mistakes from wants. Uh, for example, mm. uh, you know, the, the example I, I, I have is, is lottery tickets, you know, that, that is uh, people in standard finance don't buy lottery tickets because it's stupid, you know, that, that is it has negative returns. Uh, in the first generation of behavioral finance, uh, we said that that is because people are stupid in the way that they don't understand math and statistics. And I say, imagine that you are at 7-Eleven uh, behind somebody about to buy a ticket and, and you say, listen, uh, you think that the odds of winning are one out of 100 million. In fact, they are one out of 200 million. Uh, will that person then say, whoa, now that I know that I will not buy that ticket? Well, of course, uh, that is silly. <laughs> that, that is people buy lottery tickets because, because it provides the emotional benefits of hope for the entire week. They, they uh, have, you know, they, they are having that expressive benefit that I'm in the game uh, and God knows, you know, somebody is going to win and why, why won't it be me? And so yeah. you have those three kinds of benefits, utilitarian, expressive, and emotional. And that is true for normal people, both in the second generation and the third generation of behavioral finance. Hmm. Does, does the, the lottery ticket explanation also explain why, normal investors like to have lottery-like assets in their portfolios? That is right. That is right. Yeah, I, I like to say that people want two things in life. One is uh, to be rich and the other is not to be poor. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, for, for some of us, uh, being rich means a, a, a startup with a, with a wonderful uh, ideas that it grows into a Google um, but for many other people, uh, you know, especially as they get older and, and it is too late for them to go to, say, medical school, uh, it is a, it is by buying a lottery ticket. And so, you know, sometimes yeah. it is really sad when you see people who, in fact, risk being poorer than they are by buying too many of those lottery tickets. But but I surely can put myself in their shoes and understand that that they really want uh, want a chance to be to be rich. And and when I talk about rich, I'm not talking about million dollar rich. That is one of the interesting things is that people who buy lottery tickets, uh, yeah, we get those super uh, uh, large. Uh, prizes uh, exceeding a billion dollars but but in fact people are looking for prizes more in the range of 10 to 50 thousand dollars enough to mm -hmm. renovate a kitchen or or, or finally uh, replace that that clunky car uh and and so on uh for those of us for whom you know renovating a kitchen or buying a car is no big deal that that seems like peanuts, but but for people who really strain uh, to uh, pay for such things, this is a big deal. Yeah, I'd like to go back to your comments on dividends. What is the explanation for why normal investors have a preference for cash dividends when rational investors should be indifferent? Well, so so one one reason uh, is because. Uh, people want to control their spending, so so they they know that that um, doing this home dividend, they, they are thinking perhaps that they can actually sell a few shares uh, and get that money if they don't get a dividend. But they know that they have imperfect uh, self control, and so if they give themselves permission to sell. 3% of shares to get that homemade dividend, uh, then what they're afraid of is that they're going to, in fact, mm. spend not three, but 10, because there is a need for, for a, a vacation. There's a something that they want to give to the kids. 
uh, and so on. And so for that reason of a limited self-control, they let the company, in fact, control them and say, you're getting three dividend, 3% dividend, uh, not more than that. So, so that is one reason uh, people do that. What people do is keep their money in separate pockets. There is capital, uh, they say the, the 401k, and there is income, the income that I get from, from my employment. Uh, I transfer money from income to capital when I move it to a 401k. And then I use a rule that we all know of don't dip into capital, which means don't cash out your 401k. Uh, and so uh, those mental accounting structure and the self-control and that rule of not dipping into capital help us control our consumption. I've got to preface this this next question by saying that one of the most exciting parts about reading your writing is that you have an incredible command of traditional finance and you're able to speak to the behavioral side alongside that. And that just makes it fascinating. So on, on that point, um, can you talk about the downsides of consuming from dividends and not touching capital? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That That, that is, uh, yeah, that, that, that really is, is, is very very important um you know i i say it is better to give with a warm hand than a cold one uh that is those of us who are successful in life in fact are the ones who have a good amount of self-control that is it takes self-control to uh, stay home and study for the exam uh, when your friends are going mm. out to a party. Uh, because with good grades, you go to graduate school, uh, you get a good job, you earn a good amount of money, then good self-control helps you save good chunks of that money and uh, you end up living uh, comfortably. The problem is that People, some people, many people get so good at self-control that they have excessive self-control and they just don't know when to relax. And, and so people will say, well, when I talk about it, people say, you are describing my parents. I'm talking to them and I'm saying, look, you worked hard all your life. We are settled. We don't really need your money. You should now enjoy your money. Uh, your rugs at home are worn yeah. out. You should replace them. Uh, I know it costs money, but then you have that that money. Uh, it is really hard for people uh, to break that habit. And I understand that. That is because spending has... Uh, utilitarian costs because of course they diminish your wealth but they can either increase your expressive and emotional benefits or reduce them so for me for example uh, if i go say if i'm compelled to go to a restaurant where where dinner costs 300 dollars because god knows it has some some you know they, they call chopped liver pate uh you know i i get I, it's not just that I lost $300. It is that I feel like an idiot. Uh, I have a feeling that the, that the um, cook is is there in the kitchen uh, pretending to be a chef uh, and laughing at those idiots who are paying those exorbitant uh, prices. But there are other things that, that give me pleasure. For example, uh, giving money to my children or contributing money to charities or treating myself uh, such that I, when I take my kids, my family and guests to a restaurant, I'm the one who is paying. I take pride in that. Uh, it costs me money, but it brings me uh, much, much pleasure. And so, and so there is a problem 
of people who have too little self-control. And generally, financial advisors are talking about that. But when you talk to financial advisors and their actual clients, they say, actually, our biggest problem is to convince people who have millions to spend and stop living as if they are poor. Why are normal investors averse to realizing losses? Well, so it begins with framing. Uh, You can hear it in the language. That is, we have paper losses and we have realized losses. And for many people, realized losses are the same as real losses. So if you have a paper loss, it is not really a loss, they they would say. Now, economists say, this is stupid. Don't you understand? Uh, if, If you bought a stock for 100 and now it is trading at 50, you have lost $50, whether you have realized that loss uh, or not. Now, the thing is that that you open a mental account, you buy a share for $100, you put it into this account. Uh, if it is now at 50 uh, and you realize that loss, uh, then you close that account at the loss. You kiss your money goodbye. There is no chance for that mm. stock to go back to $100. That is painful. That is the pain that we know as regret because now hindsight is telling you, God, wasn't it clear that this stock is a loser and so on? Well, of course it was not clear, but but now it seems in hindsight uh, to be to be clear. Now, Rationally speaking, you should realize your losses because you get tax benefits from realizing losses, whereas you don't have them in paper losses. But that uh, hindsight and that pain of regret when you close that mental account at the loss is really real for people. You know, regret is something that we have all felt. Uh, And so, again, I I understand people uh, who are reluctant to realize losses. And one of the good things financial advisors do, for example, is to help people uh, realizing their losses. Uh, You know, they they call it harvest your losses, making it feel as if realizing losses is the equivalent of walking in an orchard and plucking uh, peaches uh, from from uh, the tree rather than, you know, realizing losses while you are bent over stinking losses. Um, why is dollar cost averaging instead of doing a lump sum investment so persistent when it's well known to be rationally suboptimal? Well, it is. it comes to the same kinds of principles uh, of, of a regret aversion. Uh, so think about it this way. Uh, fear is an emotional that is instantaneous. You know, you see, you see something looks like a snake. You 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 move back. Uh, a regret is a, called a cognitive emotion because you contemplate it ahead of time. That, that is, you have two job offers. You're going to take one. Which one shall you take? Uh, and you are concerned that later on you'll find out that they actually chose. Uh, the wrong one. Uh, when, say that you just inherited $100,000 from a favorite uncle, um, now, eventually, you want to have it all in stocks. But if I say, why don't you just put the money into the stocks right now? You know, the amount is not so large that it's going to depress prices. Uh, you say, I hear you, but but you know, if I put in the money today and the stock prices crush tomorrow, uh, I'll feel stupid. I'll have that pain of regret. So by dividing uh, that money into, say, 10 chunks of, of 10,000 each and investing each on a schedule uh, in the middle of a month, over 10 months, uh, you lessen that pain of regret uh, because sometimes the price will be lower, sometimes it is going to be higher. It's kind of like a diversification principle, uh, but it, but in this case, it is really designed 
uh, to to minimize uh, your regret. And and it also because the the schedule is fixed, uh, it also uh, really lessens the likelihood of self control. You know, af- after three three uh, payments, and and if the market has gone down, you say, whoa, enough of that. Uh, by having the rule that you committed yourself to for 10 months, you're going to continue uh, to do that. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's both a, a commitment device and a regret diversification tool. You can actually see that hmm. uh, when you think about what we know as reverse dollar cost averaging. L- let's say that you got <clears throat> not $100,000 in cash, but rather stocks that are worth $100,000 and you want them actually in cash, uh, then, uh, you know, if you're re- averse to risk, because usually people say, I invest in dollar cost averaging because I am not willing to take the risk, but it has nothing to do with risk. And you can see that here, because if you are really averse to risk, you should sell those stocks right now and have cash, which is riskless. Uh, but that's not pe- what people do because people are afraid that as soon as they sell that uh, stock for one hundred thousand dollars, stock prices will zoom, uh, and they're going to be left holding the bag and feeling regret uh, for having sold them all. And so, if you do it gradually in reverse dollar cost averaging, you uh, reduce the likelihood of regret. Hmm. That's a that's a really Nice way to explain it from the other direction. What about strategies like uh, like covered calls and structured products? Why why are those so attractive to normal investors? Well, they're, they're attractive because of of the way they are framed. Uh, people hate losses and they hate hate the prospect of losses. Uh, and so, let's say that that you uh, buy a share. And, and a broker says to you, you know, why don't you do covered calls? Why don't you sell call options uh, against it? Uh, and and they say, look, in fact, I take that from a manual for brokers uh, by, by Gross. And, and what he says is you're going to have in a covered call three pos- three uh, sources of profit. First, you still hold the stock. So... Uh, you'll get dividends. That's one source. Uh, Second, you'll get the premium from selling that call. That's another source. And third, because you're going to write that call with an exercise price higher than the current price, you will have the third one because if it is called, uh, then let's say that that, uh, the exercise price is 55 and the stock is at 50 you'll still get that five percent uh five five dollar rather between 50 and 55 dollars and then he says you know what you're going to lose are those uncertain things that happen if the price goes beyond 55 but of course if you uh, find that the stock price has gone not to 55, but to 75, you're going to again feel like an idiot with regret. Uh, and so what people do, people are kind of fooled by this framing of three sources of losses. And they don't realize that when they buy a call, somebody is selling that call and that somebody might not be stupid, uh, that somebody might know something. And uh, that that you don't and so and so it is really again rationally speaking uh it makes little sense but behaviorally normally it does it does it uh, make sense and so uh this is covered calls and and you know structured products again structured products are arranged such that they have a floor you cannot lose you're sure to get your money back uh now uh, so it, it goes like like you're going to, if you put in a thousand a thousand dollars, you're sure to get back at least a thousand dollars, and on top of that, say half the increase of the S and P five hundred. Well, what what happens is is of course whoever creates that that uh, structured product 
uh, is doing it by buying a zero coupon bond and, and, and a call uh, auction. Uh, and uh, they, they, of course, make money uh, off that. And, you know, th then there are some, some other things that go. One, it is expensive because, because of the money that the bank or whoever has created it. And also using, again, the, the uh, issue of, of mental account. First, uh, they don't count the dividends. And so uh, if you were to actually hold the stock, you would get uh, the dividend. Second, if you if they give you back a thousand dollars after uh, 10 years, well, the real money that you get is less than a thousand dollars because inflation, even at two percent, it takes a chunk. Uh, and so it is really uh, designed to um designed to appeal to to people kind of like like uh, like tasty ice cream uh, that is going to settle in your waistline <laughs> so we, we've seen research showing that these things are overpriced by like five to eight percent um so i i look at that and it's like that's a, objectively a bad thing to buy could it actually be justified by their behavioral benefits well he, here is here is what i say uh, the difference between what is an error and what is a want. So, so let's say that that I am a, a trusted teacher, and I tell a, a student, uh, "Listen, uh, you will pay eight percent on top of that, on top of what what it really is worth. Um, is it worth it to you?" Uh, now. If they say, whoa, now I understand that, I will never touch them again, then I know that it was an error or ignorance that caused that person to buy them. But if they say, well, I'll still do that, just as the person who says, I'll still buy lottery tickets, then I understand that that is what they want. They, the, the pain for them of, of losing money may be so great that they're willing to pay a, an extra 8%. Uh, to avoid uh, that pain. It might not make sense to me, but it makes sense to them. You know, to me, it makes no sense to buy a Lexus when I can buy an equivalent Toyota. But, you know, I don't think that people who buy Lexus are stupid. You know, they just they just are status seeking uh, in ways that I am not. You know, I'm status seeking in, in other ways. Uh, but not in automobiles. My 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 uh, main car. Well, my, my wife just just insisted that, to get a Subaru Outback for me. But my real car is a 1994 Toyota Camry station wagon. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. But that that definition of the difference between errors and wants that was incredible. Very very cool. Why do normal, wealthy people want to invest in hedge funds and private equity despite their questionable benefits to a rational investor? Well, you know, that comes back to the issue of status seeking that I that I describe. Uh, in fact, one one person, an advisor who sort of sells or, or, or uh, recommends hedge funds and the like, uh, told me that that when when an investor comes to him with say ten million dollars uh, after he sold his business, uh, if he says, "Well, you can invest it in in um, index funds," uh, well, the minimum to invest in an index fund might be three thousand dollars. You know, he says, "I don't want to be with those little people." You know, I am now a big shot. Uh, I have ten million dollars. Let me have something that is that is unique to those uh, high ones uh, and so uh when you buy a hedge fund and when you tell people you know if we have a conversation and i tell you uh a conversation about investments so you're not really bragging you you're you're just telling me that you invest in hedge funds well i immediately know that you are at least moderately rich uh, without you being so crass as to say, hi, I'm mayor and I'm a rich man. Uh, mm. And so people buy hedge funds for the same reason that people buy 
uh, Lexus and Mercedes Benz and 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 another uh, luxury cars. Yes, they take you from A to B, but they also tell other people and tell yourself that you are a big shot. Okay, I, I want to ask your your opinion on a very practical question for us because we believe in index funds being the most sensible investment for most people. But we also have seen the exact scenario that you just described. Do you, should should people in our position be catering to that to that want for more exotic investments? Well, it is it is a, my sense of financial advisors is that you like me are, are teachers uh, first and foremost, and so it comes back to the difference between between error and want. Uh, if your client. Uh, thinks that, in fact, hedge funds are riskless assets with returns that are fabulous, then you can abuse, disabuse them of that notion, yet you can teach them. But if uh, they sort of say in one way or another that they want to feel special, uh, then then uh, what can you do? That, that is a uh, uh, you do that, you try to minimize the damage uh, in the same way that that if you if you uh, have a, a client or a prospect who wants to avoid, say, oil companies in, in his or her portfolio, uh, you don't really say, look, I'm, I'm here to just make you money and then you can do with it whatever you want. You know, you, you kind of listen to them uh, and you try to find the solution that is consistent with their values, but it is not too expensive, uh, does not damage their wealth more than than can be done. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. So it's kind of like a, making sure that they understand the trade-offs and then you can kind of gauge whether it's an error or a want. Yeah. And, and again, remember, the, the issue is well-being. What you're trying to do is maximize the well-being of your clients. And, and you do that in a gentle way. And you realize mm -hmm. that well-being uh, is different from for different people. That, that is, if a friend told you that that he has two offers, you know, one that is a job that he's going to hate but makes a lot of money, and one uh, that makes a, enough a, and more than enough, but but he is going to be happy to get up in the morning uh, and a, and do that work. Uh, you're going to say. What are you trying to do with your life? You know, mm -hmm. do, do you really want a job where you're going to hate it every day just because it pays you more? Uh, and so you see that people come to different conclusions. You know, some people go to to investment companies where they work like dogs and make a ton of money and then say retire and and live off that. And other people choose to be, say, professors <laughs> or, or financial advisors making more than enough money to live on, but uh, but not uh, fabulously wealthy uh, and, uh, you know, maximize their well-being this way. Hmm. We talked about regret earlier. How do you think normal households should deal with currency hedging in their portfolios from the perspective of regret? Yeah, well, you know the, that that is always the the case. So so let's say that you you invest in foreign markets, uh, foreign stocks. So uh, the value, your returns in dollars, are a function of how much uh, those say Japanese stocks have gone up in yen, and what happened to the value of the yen relative to the American uh, dollar. Now, generally, those funds do not hedge uh, against currency fluctuations, uh, and that is a good thing. Uh, but but if you have a situation where the currency fluctuations kind of hurt your returns in dollars, people become sensitive to it. And so it really is an issue less for individual investors and more for uh, institutional investors and lots of institutional investors have gotten into the habit of hedging half of it. <laughs> so, so they kind of minimize their regret by having, well, you know, I have, I have a bit of this and a bit of that. And, 
and and I'm I'm happy about that and sad about that, but but it kind of cancels out that, that kind of psychological mind game that we are all uh, subject to. Um, so you know, I I say forget it. You know, just just do it in a cheap way because if you buy Japanese stocks and then hedge uh, the yen. Uh, you'll pay extra for the hedging part. Uh, it's not worth doing. Hmm. Since we know about all these normal but potentially suboptimal behaviors, you know, what, what should normal investors do with this found knowledge? Well, I think I think that if if um, investors are educated, and by by educated, I don't mean financial literacy in the sense that it is usually measured. That is. Do you know about compounding? Do you know that when interest rates go up, the value of bonds goes down? But rather, if you know the science of finance, that is, if you know the facts, if you know, for example, that more often than not, active mutual funds trail index funds, and therefore uh, it is wiser to buy index funds. And by the way, even if, on average, active funds do better than index funds. There's going to be a range. Uh, you know, some of them are going to to trail the index by a lot, and some of them are going to beat it by a lot. But you don't know ahead of time which is going to be. Uh, the nice thing about about uh, index funds is that you're going to be always in the middle, always mediocre. But but I say. It's better to be mediocre than uh, to be the goat. Uh, and so uh, that is uh, what I do. And so, and so you know, if, if you if people have true financial literacy, uh, such as uh, I described why index funds are, are superior, then then they're going to make wiser decisions. Uh, then they're going to uh, for example, um, you know, do dollar cost averaging, fine. You know, it's no big deal, fine. Just divide it uh, into 10, 10 chunks uh, and invest. That, that's not really a, a big deal. But but if you chase the recent uh, trend uh, and concentrate your portfolio in, um, you know, whatever technology or, or health or whatever, uh, that I think is less than wise. Hmm. It, it sounds like it's another case of the uh, understanding the difference between errors and wants. Yeah, that is right. Yeah, yeah. Is that 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 I, th I think there was a clothing store that said an educated customer is our best customer. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that a lot. Okay, so we, we've been talking about the the, the behavior of normal investors as opposed to rational ones. I want to move on to portfolio theory. How, how is port, uh, behavioral portfolio theory different from traditional mean variance portfolio theory? Well, you know, um, so here's a story. Uh, I met uh, Harry Markowitz uh, in person uh, almost 30 years ago at a conference uh, in fact, I told that story uh, because I spoke at the same conference uh, just uh, a month ago, uh, and uh, and so when when we sat down uh, to lunch, I took the opportunity to sit with with Harry Markowitz, and and of course we engaged in a conversation, and I explained to him what a uh, behavioral portfolio theory is all about by pointing to the food plate that was uh, in front of him and, and in front of me. And I said this, uh, mean variance portfolios look at the world from the perspective of the stomach. That is, they know that the steak and the mashed potatoes and the broccoli are uh, you know, they're just there because they are carrying nutrients and vitamins and so on. So why don't we just put them all in a blender and then and then suck it in with a straw? Uh, you get the same vitamins and and nutrients and, and so on. Uh, now, what I say is that behavioral portfolios 
are one where you want your steak hot, uh, you want your mashed potatoes hot, uh, you want your beer cold, uh, and and so on. Uh, and and Harry Markowitz understood it immediately. He is a wonderful man. I'm really a, a very fortunate man uh, to know him. Uh, and he understood it perfectly. He understands investors. And in fact, years later, uh, we, the two of us, Markowitz and I, and, and two of our colleagues, uh, wrote a paper that kind of combines mean variance portfolio with behavioral portfolio theory, uh, such that people keep their money in different mental accounts. There's money for retirement, there's money for education, there's money to leave for the kids. Uh, and yet you can do that in a way that is efficient, in a way that, that lies on the efficient uh, frontier. And so th this really, again, it, it all kind of comes back to to the issue of well-being that underlies it. That is, how is it that you can help people uh, maximize their well-being? In fact, I, I tell a story, uh, kind of apocryphal story, about going to an advisor and he uh, does a Monte Carlo simulation and all my assets and goals. And he says, Mayor, I have a wonderful news for you. You have a 90% chance of achieving all your financial goals. And I go home to my wife and I said, I just found that there's a 10% chance we're going to live in the street. Uh, compare that to if the advisor puts my money in those two buckets, one for not being poor, one for being rich. And now I say to my wife, I learned that our retirement is going to be secure. We'll have money for, for car, for fixing the roof and, and all of that. And on top of that, we have a 20% chance to leave a good chunk of money uh, to the kids. It is the same money, but it feels differently because, because it is framed in those mental accounts that correspond to the particular goals I have. So, so goal-based uh, investing is really built on behavioral portfolio theory. I, I've got to say that food analogy was incredible on, on many levels because I, I think you can even take it a step further and say that the, the food in the blender is even a little bit more efficient and maybe the main- <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you can gulp it up uh, faster. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, you know, those those bits of knowledge that you get along the way kind of come back uh, really in an insightful way. When, when I was a student at the Hebrew University many, many years ago, uh, there was really a footnote in a book by, by Samuelson uh, about something that George Stigler, uh, also a Nobel Prize winner, uh, did early on, and, and he uh, calculated... Uh, what is the best diet if you want it to be the least expensive one that satisfies all your nutrition need? And, and, and all you need is kind of five or six, uh, you know, evaporated milk uh, and, and beans. <laughs> and, and of course, you kind of look at it and say, well, it may work for pigs. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I would like to have some chocolates from time to time. Uh, and so that that is again, you know, you really have to understand people, people like me, people like you. Uh, we like we like to have uh, more than uh, the the minimum cost diet. I must say, Mayor, I love your stories. Um, so how does the Marcus portfolio, portfolio theory get applied to behavioral portfolios? Well, so, so you know, kind of coming back in a way to, to what I just, I just said, that, that is, uh, if a client comes to you as an advisor, uh, just saying that your overall portfolio had a return of whatever, of, of 10% or minus 20%, uh, in fact, Clients, as you know, uh, hate the idea of putting all their money into, say, a global mutual fund. Uh, they want to have kind of a, the equivalent of the steak and the beer and, and, and so on, so that uh, you as, a, as, a, as an advisor can say, well, yes, I know we, we, we have lost uh, money on 
uh, on these stocks, but we made money on the international stocks or the large stocks or the value stocks and so on. By by having those uh, separate entities, uh, you can you can kind of uh, in some way co comfort uh, investors. Of course, <laughs> many investors will really zero in on the one that did the worst, and they're going to say, "See, you are you chose for me that stupid investment that that went down, and and you're an advisor, so you should have known that ahead of time, uh, and so on." You know, I I know that life of advisors is not perfect either. <laughs> How would a portfolio optimized for behavioral portfolio theory look through something like the CAPM lens? Uh, I don't really know that, that CAPM uh, enters <clears throat> into it. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the CAPM is kind of built on mean variance portfolio theory, and it is a very uh nice and uh, and neat model uh, this is why we kind of we professors like to present it to our students but you know we have moved away from it now we are talking about a three factor or four factor or five factors god knows uh what what it is it is it is really you know, when, when people say, well, you know, behavioral finance is really nice and I understand the stories and so on. And my husband or wife behaves this way, blah, blah. But it does not have the rigor, the heft of standard finance. I say, what are you talking about? You know, that, that is think about think about mean variance. Who is actually applying mean variance as mean variance? That, that is, you put reasonable parameters into a, an optimizer and it comes back and it says, put 70% in Russian stocks and the rest in Bitcoin. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, you say, okay, no, no Russian stocks. So you have a constraint, uh, no Russian stocks and, and no more than 3% in um, in Bitcoin, and and then and then you eventually with those iterations you get what you wanted in the first place. But now you can say Nobel Prize winning strategy, blah blah blah. Uh, what is what is the the asset pricing model of Standard Finance? You know, it is no longer the CAPM. It is a mess. It is really they talk about the factor zoo. Uh, so what what I think of as behavioral finance is that it provides a realistic picture of the world of finance, and then it also provides with it kind of guidance as to how you can increase your well-being the most uh, by by uh, by knowledge. Uh, and by guidance of mm. of advisors and by the kind of hand holding, so this is why I I describe financial advisors as financial physician. Uh, it is not enough that you know the intricacies of uh, covered calls and and the uh, stocks, bonds, and the rest of it. You really also have to have the kind of bedside manner that physicians have to really increase people's well-being beyond just increasing their wealth. Mm, that, that was awesome. I, 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 want, I want to repeat part of it back and make sure that I, I, I uh, interpret it right. The models of standard finance are messy enough that to evaluate a behavioral portfolio and call it suboptimal would almost be irrelevant because the models are so messy anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that that generally makes sense. Now, now th there are some things, you know, th that is diversification. You know, that that is really part of of mean variance. Mm. But actually, diversification and the benefits of diversification were known before uh, mean variance and so on. That has been with us uh, forever. And so the the issue again is how to use knowledge for the benefit of investors clients students uh and and this this means knowing not just the facts of finance you know that that when interest rates go up the value of bonds go down but also knowing uh knowing people you know i i always tell the story that i heard years ago from from one advisor about a, a couple that came uh to him and they said 
before you start planning for us, uh, you should know that we have a disabled son and we have to arrange for uh, resources for him when we are gone. Uh, so every family has its points of pain and, and a good advisor, like a good physician, finds those points of pain. And sometimes people are not I'm not saying that, you know, so, so you really have to to be kind of like, like if it's, there, there are some things that are embarrassing uh, that you are embarrassed to disclose even to your physician. Uh, but but when you have a physician that you trust, you do that and then you create a, a connection that is more than maximize my return mm. uh and the same applies applies here so so when clients kind of disclose uh, their points of pain and i say you know if it is comfortable for you as an advisor disclose your own uh because then people are going to be uh to be open with you uh because if if they think that you're perfect and they have this problem uh they may mm. not uh, share it but if you tell them that you are imperfect either then then uh, they will do that and also tell them you know that, that is when they come and they say i'm afraid of the market and all of that uh you can begin by saying i understand that because i too am afraid mm. uh here is what what I do. That, that is the knowledge I have is what I have that you don't have, and my service to you is in imparting that knowledge. Interesting. You mentioned factors. How does behavioral theory interpret the return premiums that come from these factors like size and value? Well, so so you know. Initially, when, when Pharma and French introduced their three-factor model, they said that size and book-to-market are, in fact, proxies for risk. Well, there have been many papers that looked at it and they said, no, it cannot really be a proxies for risk. Uh, Herr Schefflin and I uh, wrote a paper where, where we made the point, uh, argued that they are really... Um, they are really proxies for people's want. And so growth stocks are more prestigious, you know, they're, they're likely to have to have a Tesla um, and they're likely to have a Facebook and they're likely to have all of that uh, rather than General Motors and Ford and, and, and so on uh, that are in the uh, value uh, category. Uh, and so people prefer say large stocks growth stocks because uh, of the same reason that some people prefer a Lexus to a Toyota uh, that that is still likely the case but but you also see that value and size have been dogs for two decades now uh, and uh, and so uh, I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that either. And I'm I'm kind of more inclined to think that there's just too much randomness in it. And by the time you describe, you, you find that that uh, there's a particular factor that works, uh, distinguishes high returns from low returns, this is just the time when it stops working. Uh, and this is why uh, I, I, you know, I, I really don't have much of a tilt in, in any direction. Now, I, I do have a growth fund and a value fund, you know, index funds, uh, but but now it is kind of for historical reasons uh, because, because the growth fund has a lot of capital gains that I don't want to realize. Uh, and, uh, and by having roughly the same amount of growth and value, I have in fact the equivalent of a total market portfolio. Hmm. Very interesting to hear uh, about your portfolio. How, how do you think that the typical risk profile questionnaires that financial advisors use can be adapted to improve the behavioral dimension of decisions that we've been talking about? Well, 
there, there are many uh, questionnaires, as, as you surely know, and some of them kind of claim that they are built on whatever scientific uh, uh, um, principles. Uh, some of them actually have questions that are not about risk, but but they are they are relevant. Uh, for example, uh, they they will uh, ask you um, about say they, they'll tell you a story. Uh, here's a company that uh, where you've lost a good a chunk of money uh, on their stock, but now they've been reorganized and they have new management and so on. Uh, would you invest in it? Uh, well, this really is a question not about risk, but rather of regret. That that is, uh, this is a case where where that dog bit you, and now they're telling you that this is a well-behaved dog. Are you going to trust that or not? You know, you remember that the pain of that bite is still with you, and and all of that. Uh, uh, then there are questions like like, uh, do you feel a uh, confident in your ability to choose stocks? Well. You know, this this <laughs> this is about about overconfidence and and people who are overconfident, uh, overconfident, you know, are, are willing to choose to choose risky stuff. Of course, they are going to scream when it goes down, but but that is what what they do now when they answer the questionnaire. So I don't really put much trust in these. I, th I think that that advisors use them mostly. Uh, to cover their the rear end if if a client sues, but uh, having a conversation with a client that that highlights those issues of of hindsight and and framing and regret and and risk uh, that is a that is valuable and you can do that with a questionnaire or, or I think better yet do it as a as a conversation uh, with with clients. To really fit their portfolio to to who they are and what they want to do. Hmm. You, you've mentioned the role of financial advisors quite a few times. What role do you think they should play in correcting behavioral errors of clients? Hmm. Well, as I said, advisors are like me. You know, they are educators hmm. first and foremost, and so. And so it is really important for them. I was asked, you know, sh should they explain those cognitive shortcuts and errors? I say, of course they should. You know, that, that is, it's not like like, like a, a physician uh, who knows that a patient has cancer and he says, no, 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 th this is just, a, you know, ju just a, a slight pain in your stomach. Uh, you really have to be, to be mindful, of course, uh, uh, do it gently, but... Uh, so, for example, hindsight, you know, I always say, always begin by admitting that that is an error that is known to you as well. Uh, you're not smarter than your client. Uh, you just know more. And so let me explain to you how hindsight is working, how framing is working, how overconfidence is working, uh, and and so on. Uh, that really is a big part of what of what uh, advisors do now uh how much do you bend to to your clients well uh as i said you know if somebody comes and says uh, i want to be socially responsible and this is what what it means to me uh an answer that um you know i'm here to make you money and then you can do what what you want tells that prospect this this fellow does not really listen to me it doesn't care about me. He has one mm. solution that he's going to shove down my throat. I actually use this analogy a lot. And I say, imagine that it's an Orthodox Jew who is facing you. And you say, listen, pork tastes pretty good, uh, costs less than kosher beef. Why don't you buy and eat pork and donate the savings to your synagogue? You know, everybody understands that that is ridiculous. Uh, and to somebody who feels that having oil stocks in his portfolio feels like pork in the mouth of an orthodox man uh that that uh, you know then then avoid these but if you think that you are doing good to the world by avoiding oil stocks then uh an advisor should explain that that, that is simply uh, not true 
Uh, and that may take more than a few minutes to explain how markets work and, and why it, you do no good by, by excluding oil from your particular portfolio. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I have great admiration for conscientious advisors. Uh, they really have a hard job. Uh, I, as a teacher, uh, I really try to educate all my students, every one of them. But sometimes there is somebody who says, you know, I didn't really learn anything or, or, or something like that. It really, it really is, is very painful, but I still get paid by the university, not by that student. And of course, advisors, you know, if they don't satisfy a client, the client leaves and there's no more uh, revenue from that client. And so, you know, you are, you are in a more difficult situation uh, there than I am. And so, you know, I, I describe your work as being sacred work, a kind of like, like a, a priest, a minister or rabbi, uh, because you are uh, responsible for their financial well-being and, and ultimately uh, life well-being. Hmm. Are there other ways that financial advisors like us can use behavioral finance principles to improve our client outcomes? Well, I don't know that I have much to add beyond that. I, I, th I think that, that again, if, if client, if advisors know that that what they are trying to do for the client is enhance their well-being uh, then then they're going to educate them on on financial instruments financial markets the kinds of wants and and cognitive errors and emotional errors and 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 so on uh, and then uh, be patient you know that, that is uh if I explain something uh, and and I see in the eyes of my students that they didn't get it, I don't say my students are stupid. I say I didn't explain it well. So let me see if I can explain it better. Uh, and and if if uh, I explain if you explain to a client that that it's not a good idea to let fear cause you to get rid of all the stocks in your portfolio. Uh, and you think that you just did it and then comes another dip in the market and then the client is calling you again with the same story. Uh, just be patient, you know, explain it again. Don't say, didn't we just talk about it? You know, why, why do you bother me with a question that I already answered? Just just be, be gentle uh, because people are vulnerable and, uh, and because, again, good... Uh, advisors, good financial advisors are good financial physicians, good at both knowledge of the facts of finance and how to convey them to their clients. What do you think puts financial advisors in a position to give well-being advice? Because like, they're not a therapist, they're financial advisors. Yeah, well, I, I think that there's just a, a need for advisors to change their view of who they are. Mm. Uh, you know, I I um, I spoke uh, at a CFA, it might have been the, the one that, that you attended, a CFA Institute uh, on, on Wealth Management. Uh, and and I, uh, I remember uh, that Charlie Henneman, uh, who used to organize the, the, the seminars, the, the, those conferences, uh, we talked about it because because um, CFAs uh, are resentful of CFPs uh, because uh, they say we, with our education, we are holding, we know a whole lot more about hedge funds and about strategies and 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 so on. Uh, why is it that people actually prefer CFPs to us? Uh, and the answer is that CFPs at least learn something about behavioral finance and they learn something about uh, about how it is that that you can help people knowing people's proclivities and so on, how you can use behavioral finance, in fact, uh, to help them. Now, now, now the, the CFA 
uh, degree, of course, includes includes a behavioral finance as 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 a component. But but still, uh, you know, some some financial advisors behave as if what they really would like to do is to manage a hedge fund, mm. and now they have to deal with those stupid uh, individual investors. Uh, and you know, and and that of course rubs on 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 clients, you know, and and they they don't like it. Uh, uh, if so, so what you need really is less of those um, geniuses at uh, at investments, and more at good people who can manage investors, uh, know enough about investments, but but uh, then. Um, you know, th- then then uh, know how to to help uh, investors, and so I say, you know, I mean, I know generally about hedge funds, but I don't know the intricacies of of hedge funds. Uh, do I uh, do I need to know that? Uh, no, I don't. You know, uh, any more than I need to know exactly how my car uh, goes from from engine to transmission. Uh, and to the wheels, you know. I just know that somehow I turn on the engine, and and I go. And yep. and the same applies to to uh, advisors. So so advisors need a different kinds, different set of skills. And by the way, those technical skills, uh, robo advisors do them at much much lower cost you know realizing losses they do that harvesting losses they 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 construct portfolios they do those questionnaires and and so on so if you if you think that you're competing pie chart against pie chart you're mm-hmm. going to lose uh the the thing that binds clients to you is the thing that bind patients to physicians <laughs> Yeah, I t- totally agree with you. I, I asked the question because I could imagine listeners wondering the same thing, but you you absolutely uh, delivered an excellent answer. Uh, we've got two, two more questions for you, Mayor. Um, do, do you think on the topic that we were just talking about, do you think that financial advisors should be pursuing education beyond you know reading your papers uh, that aligns with becoming well-being advisors? Well, you know, education is a wonderful thing. I, for example... Uh, subscribe to to SSRN dot uh, com, uh, and I think that that it is reasonably free. Uh, and and I just delight in in reading abstracts of new papers as they come. Uh, and and you know they, they kind of say, "Wow, uh, this really is fascinating, and this really expands my knowledge, and this relates to something that I already know." And 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 I think that advisors can do that. Now, most of the papers are of, of no interest. You know, I just scan them and and I, I shove them aside. But but there's more than one gem uh, per day that I find, and I keep oh. I keep a, a list of those abstracts and 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 so on. I think that advisors would do well uh, to. Uh, to subscribe to this uh, and uh, and read it, and so th- there's a need to kind of learn in an efficient way. You know, you don't have to read the entire paper. Most of the times, an abstract gives you all you need, and it is it is much uh, much faster. Hmm. Final question, Mayor: How do you define success in your life? Well. I think that that success is is well being. You know, do you? Uh, I know that I am a successful man now because my well being is much higher than than it used to be. Hmm. Uh, I know that I have a, enough money uh, such that I can spend comfortably. You know, I can treat the others to dinner uh, and 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 so on. And 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 uh, either because I've reached my aspirations or because I've tempted down my aspirations sufficiently uh, that I just let things slide. You know that that is sure. Lots of people have more money than me, uh, 
but and lots of people published more papers than than I did and wrote more books and 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 so on but I'm really happy with with what I have and more than that 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 is I am happy in my ability to help other people uh of course students in the classroom and readers of my of my uh, books and and articles but also are uh, people who simply uh, have less and and have lower well-being and so we we contribute my wife and i contribute a good deal of money uh, to to charity to people who 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 need help um we we established an endowment uh, at Santa Clara University to help a uh, uh members of the faculty do do their mm-hmm. research and and teaching and not worry about whether they're going to have enough funds uh, for it and just just i just let things let things slide uh you know th- there is there is this joke about the tombstone that says published but perished anyway uh and i say you know like all good jokes it is funny because there's a grain of truth in it mm-hmm. uh i say really quoting a friend of mine uh 10 years after i'm gone only my children will remember me well maybe a a a, a student or two a, i hope more a, but but i i kind of know the difference of between what really matters and and what does not and i focus on those things that enhance my well-being what a beautiful cap to an incredible conversation mayor we're so appreciative of you joining us thank you so much thank you it was delighting i I was delighted to speak with with the two of you and uh, i look forward to uh being in touch again thanks mayor